We were in Stonewall, Mississippi, and Aaron was, gosh, she's probably six, I imagine. I don't think he's much more than seven. And I started in seminary in Memphis. And I've been up Saturday, working in the field and getting ready for Sunday. I've been up all day Sunday preaching. And I, I, I had to leave before midnight because it's a six and a half, six and a half or seven hour drive from Stonewall, Mississippi to Memphis. And so I, I laid down trying to wind down from Sunday. And, and, and I, so I've been up about, I, I've been up for a couple of days and nights. Then I drove all the way to Memphis. I had school all day Monday. I drove home Monday night. So by the time I got home, I'd been up about three days and three nights. And I mean, man, I mean, I was whooped. And so when I got in there, I didn't go, I didn't go to, 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 to our bed. I laid down in the couch. I didn't want, I didn't want to wake up. Hey, but I had driven through a lot of thunderstorms. By the time I got there, they caught up to me. So I, I lay down, and you can hear the flash, boom, boom, boom. He's scared of the night. He's scared of the darkness. And so we kept night lights on. There's a night. There's a light outside of his window. There's a light inside of his room. And that that light and that thunder knocked out a transformer and went boom, and it went completely black. And I, about that, I heard this this squeal. You who are parents understand the squeal. And when I jumped up off of the couch, went running back there, I realized what happened. That the, it, it knocked that transformer, knocked that the, the lights in the house was pitch dark. I went running back there, slid around to the corner. And when I got to Aaron's room, he was both up right in bed, and man, tears were just flowing down his cheek. And I said, son, you okay? And about the time I got it out of my mouth, that nightlight flickered back on me. He said, oh, my daddy, God done turned on my nightlight. Oh, <laughs> oh man, listen, have you ever been there? Have you been surrounded by darkness and scared slim to death? Has God turned on your night light? See, the psalm today, uh, in Psalm 23, you can stand if you wish to. Psalm 23 has been used by, human, by our human family for some 4,000 years. And it speaks then as it speaks now to the human heart and human need. It's about life and love and death and thine issues. Let me read it, then let me unpack it for just a little bit this morning and see if I can't share with you David's story to us all. Let me read. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside white waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his reputation, his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest of valleys, I will fear no evil because you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they are a comfort unto me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God. Amen. 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 We said last week that as David wrote this song, there are certain truths within it and around it that has, that has great meaning. We said that sheep lack a sense of direction. They have no internal GPS. A sheep, a sheep going to get lost. They cannot help themselves. You can put them inside a corral, and they cannot find their way out the door. Is that not crazy? You can put them inside of a compound. You can put them inside of a corral, and they cannot find the goddamn door because they have no sense of direction. Does that not speak to you and me? I believe that it does. They're completely defenseless. You ever heard sheep? <laughs> you know? I mean, there's no horns, there's no, there's no teeth, there's no claws. I mean, their 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 voice is not intimidating. They got nothing, man, nothing at all. They can't run because of their big old bodies, their little bitty knobby knees. They can't run. They can't fight. 
They're completely defenseless. Sound like us? They're easily frightened. Sound like us? Do you know there's, they're honest with God's scared of their own shadow? I mean, I, 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 I don't want to get in the ditch, but I do want to make a passing jump. Shepherds have said, between human beings and sheep, I don't know which is the dumb. Because sheep are actually scared of their own shadow. When they're walking because of the way in which they're geared up internally, they can look around and if the sun hits them right, because it's bigger than they are and it's om ominous looking, it will completely freak them out. Does that not sound like us? Of course it does. They're by nature dirty. Sheep do not understand the need of a bath. Sheep would get out and not just like the pig go to the slop, but they would stay in the slop as long as they can. They like the dirt. Does it sound like us? They can't find food or water. They don't have the ability. They don't have a sense of smell and they can't see worse than nothing. And so they're on every level a sheep is, is absolutely, utterly dependent upon the shepherd. And the wool that belongs to the sheep that belongs to the shepherd. And as David looks back on this message, David pins these words. We usually use them at the graveside a service, a funeral service or a graveside service. We use them at the bedside of, of broken, wounded, hurt people. And yet that's not the only time in which we can use that because the, the six verses contain the greatest promises and the most powerful possibilities to be found in all the Word of God. That's why God, meant, why God allowed David to pen it. David was a shepherd. David understood sheep. David writes from the experiences of his life because David is one of those sheep. David knows how defenseless he is. David knows he has no sense of direction. David knows he's utterly and completely dependent upon the Lord. He knows that. And so he pins these words, and as he pins the word in the first verse of every song, and the verse one of every song, it tells you what it's going to tell you. And then it tells you what it told you. And so in verse one, it says that the Lord is. The Lord is my shepherd. Because we have, I, I doubt there's anybody in there that herds sheep. We don't understand the connotation. We don't understand the implication. We don't understand the psalm. And yet, if we lived in this day, everybody raised sheep. Everybody was familiar with sheep. Everybody understood the context. Everybody understood the culture. But being so far removed from the context of David's life, sometimes we struggle. We don't get it. And so David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Not was, not will be, not might, not could be. The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I've got nothing I have need of. Why? Because the sheep are utterly dependent upon the Lord. And then he begins to delineate in the next few verses what the shepherd does. And he begins by saying that he, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You ever look at that? He makes me. Have you, had a, have you ever had a stupid dog? This does not apply to cats. Cat don't listen to know how. You ever try to train a dog? And we call Rover up and say, sit. Rover don't want to sit. Sit. Rover don't want to sit. Have you ever, ever had to physically push Rover down? Have you? If you're going to train that dog, there's going to be a time when you're going to have to physically push his butt down. And when you physically push him down, you say, sit. Stay. Sit. Stay. Have you ever had children? <laughs> ever tried, tried, tried. Have you ever tried, had, tried to train a child? What do we do? Sit. Stay. And what do they do? They don't sit. They don't stay. What do we do? We physically put their butt down, don't we? Haven't you already done that? Can we not see that here? He makes me lie down. Because a sheep's nature is to be skittish. A sheep's nature is to be fearful. A sheep's nature is to be frightened. A sheep's nature is to wander. A sheep's nature is to do everything that's going to get it in trouble one day. And so in the nature of a sheep, we find ourselves. And we love to wander around. We love to, to get ourselves in trouble. We love to be rebellious. We love just wandering. And it says, the Lord makes me lie down. Why? Can, can, can we talk? I'm geared up a little bit tight. Y'all notice that? I'm a little wound up sometimes. And I get so wound up sometimes, it takes me a while to settle. You know what I'm saying? And I had to physically set my backside down, and I had to physically clean the clutter out of my mind so that I can relax. A 
Are you bound that way too? You know you are. And so God knowing us knows that if we are allowed to do what we do naturally, we cannot be at rest. We cannot settle. We will be fretful. We will be fearful. We will be messing up our lives and the lives of everybody around us. So He makes us lie down in green pastures. May I say to you, green pastures don't just happen. There is no such thing. Green pastures are created by the shepherd. The shepherd goes before the sheep. The shepherd goes and he uproots the weeds. The shepherd goes and he finds the water. The shepherd goes and he clears, cleans out the clutter around those streams and wells. The shepherd does everything so that the sheep can enjoy green pasture. Can I just play it out there? What the shepherd does is he, he calls them by their name. He gather, gathers them around him and he sits their butt down so that they can enjoy the pastures that he's made. And he says, sit down. And when they sit down, because they're nothing more than stupid sheep, they realize, <laughs> look at that, green grass. And then they start eating. Is that not God? Amen. God calls us unto himself. God has prepared resources abundantly, extravagantly, generously, hasn't He? And He calls us into Himself and He says, sit down. And when we sit down in the presence of the Almighty, we see the bounty around us and God says, sit and enjoy. Sit and relax. Sit and breathe. Sit and enjoy my presence. Sit and enjoy my bounty. Sit and enjoy my reason. My reason. Sit and enjoy. So He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. Sheep, bless their heart, are just, just again, they're just plumb dumb. And because of the way they're made, they would drown if they, sit, if they stuck their nose in water, they would drown. Ever seen a sheep? Got a big old one looking face, nose, great big old nostrils. Because they don't understand, you should not go, you shouldn't suck in when you go down. They will put their nose under water and suck in, and they will drill themselves. And they're scared of running water because they may be dumb or they completely stupid. You know what I'm saying? And so they understand that if they, because of the running water, it makes them skittish because they know innately that if they get to the water and they get their wool wet, it's going to drown them. And so they will not go, I don't care how tired they are. I don't care how, how weary they are. I don't care how worn they are. They will not drink running water. It has to be still. And so the shepherd, we hear it all the time. He lays down across the stream. Yeah, he can do that. But he can also do other things. He can put rocks in the water too. But by whatever way he does it, he makes it so that there's still water. He makes me lie down in great pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Aren't you glad he doesn't throw you in the deep end and say drown or swim? Amen? Because most of us will drown, wouldn't we? He, he leads us to a point in our lives. He leads us down a pathway so that he knows we are ready, willing, and desirous of water. Does that make sense? If you've got a rebellious streak and you've got to beat it, slam out of it, won't it? Or life will. And so God knows there's times in our life we won't settle down and we won't listen, we won't pay attention until sometimes life takes us through a journey when we are ready and willing and, and able to listen to God. And when we are ready, willing, and able to listen to God, God will let us drink from deep, deep wells of God's goodness and God's grace. Amen. And so, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Because she can't help themselves, they wander. And when they wander, they're going to get in trouble. And the shepherd is loving, and the shepherd is kind, and the shepherd 
is understanding and all that kind of stuff. But after a while, the shepherd has had just about enough of this wandering sheep. And if that sheep will not pay attention, if that sheep continues to wander, if that sheep does not come home as he should, the shepherd will catch that thing out of the thicket. He will take that lamb out of that sheep, out of the situation that it's wandered into. He'll put it up over his shoulders and he'll break his front leg. And we say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. May I say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Amen. Because God will break you if you keep on wandering. God will break you until he gets your attention. You say, that ain't how I understand my Bible. Maybe you need to read your Bible again. Maybe you need to read that Bible all over again. That's not being ugly. May I say to you, let's talk it all the way up before you get off retail. Are you a good mama or daddy? Are you? And now, if you've got a child that will not pay attention, what are you going to do? Are you going to put him in timeout? You're going to say, what are you going to do? If that child's going to get himself in trouble, if that child's going to get hurt, if that child's going to be burnt, if that child's going to get some power or no, if that child's going to put himself or herself in danger, and you're the parent that God has created us to be or to become, there is a point in our lives when we have to do something to get that child's attention. Don't we? God is no different. And so God will take that wandering sheep. He has done everything he can, but if sheep continues to rebel, he'll take that sheep, he'll break the front leg, and he'll put it over his shoulder. He'll split the leg, and he'll put it over his shoulder, and he does that to restore that sheep unto himself. Why? Because that sheep does not just impact his own life, he impacts the life of the flock. Does that make sense? That wandering sheep will take the rest of them with them. That wandering sheep will take those others who have a propensity to wander, and they will follow that sheep, and there's not just one, it's a whole bunch of them. The same thing is true in humanity. If God doesn't do something, if we cannot control ourselves, God will get us. And so God restores our soul. Not only that. He says he, he guides me in a path of righteousness and right paths for his name's sake. Do you know God's reputation is at stake? You ever thought about that? When we name the name of Jesus, people look at us, don't they? Don't they? Now let's, let's play that out. When people look at a sheep, a flock of sheep, they say, gosh, that is a beautiful flock of sheep. They're well tended to. They're fat. The wool is nice. They're in good health. They're in good shape. It ain't the sheep who did it. It's the shepherd who did it, isn't it? And so because of the sheep, the shepherd gets a reputation. People look at the sheep and they judge the shepherd. People look at the sheep and they give the shepherd a reputation. People look at the sheep and they decide based on the sheep whether or not they want to hang with the shepherd. And so God is no different. When you and I, sheep of the flock of God Almighty, when we get out there Monday through Saturday, we act like a bunch of fools, yet we come in here on Sunday morning, we throw on a facade of consciousness, all we're doing is messing with this reputation. Because people look at us and they judge our shepherd, don't they? They look at us and they say, if that's all he's got, I don't need it. I got that already. If that's the best that he can do, I don't want him. I don't need him. He's got nothing to offer me. But when you and I walk the walk, talk the talk, do the deeds, and live the life we ought to, then what we're doing is we're restoring the reputation of our shepherd. So God does all these things so that he has the reputation. He leads us, guides us, directs us down these pathways so that people look at us and as they follow us, they realize that we can lead them to a place they've never been before. And that's in peace and joy and holiness. Amen. Then he changes. And he said, yeah, I'm going to walk through deep valleys. Yes, I'm going to go through a time of the valley of the shadow of death. But I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come. As David tells his tale, David reminds us, 
Not every pathway is going to be rosy. Not every pathway is going to be joy-filled. Have you ever had misery in your life? Ever had trouble in your life? Ever had sorrow in your life? Troubles, trials, and tragedy are part and parcel of every one of us. We're going to walk through the valley of, of the shadows. We're going to go sometimes out of the light into the darkness. And when we do that, we're going from one field to another field. It takes two mountains to make a valley. Amen? Amen. If it takes two, valley, two mountains to make a valley, God's trying to tell us something. God is trying to tell us that we're going to go into it, but there's something better on the other side. We're going to go into it, but you're not supposed to pitch a tent in it. You're supposed to travel through it. You don't travel lead ways, you travel across it. And if you follow the shepherd, you will. And so as that sheep gets up to the, to the precipice, leading down to the dark, dark valley, they're scared. They have every reason to be scared. They have every reason in the world to be tenuous about the journey before them. And so the shepherd got to kick them in the backside and say, y'all go on them. The shepherd gets in front of them. And as the shepherd gets in front of them, the sheep are following their shepherd. The sheep believe in their shepherd. The sheep have experienced the love and grace of their shepherd. And they're not afraid because they are following their shepherd. So he gets out in front of them and he reaches back and he corrects them or he grabs them and he picks them up and he takes them and he, and, and he continues to to be a blessing. He continues to be a comfort. He continues to be with them all the way down into the valley, in the valley, and up the other side. Does that not rock your world? To know that God loves us that much? Amen. To know that no matter what valley you go into, God's already been there? You do realize, of course, that God, that Christ died for us, didn't He? Amen. So when we experience death, He already has. He experienced resurrection, and one day we will too. He's experienced death. He's experienced resurrection. He's experienced the power of God. He's experienced the promises of God. And we can too. And so God, to, God through His prophet David, tells us that although we go to the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because He's with us. What does that mean? It means that He's with us in power and promise. It, it uses the analogy, it uses the picture of the of the his staff in his rod. He also says this: "You even prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies." That, that, that has always baffled me. Can I share what I think it means? The shepherd in, in the early part of the year, they're enjoying the grass of the lowland. But when the summer heat comes, it destroys and kills them. They've got to go to another path. They've got to go to other pastures. May I remind you, God won't let you sit still. Amen? God won't let you sit still. God will move us to maturity. God will move us into His will. God will move us into His purposes. God will move us where God wants us to be. God will never let you sit still. God will never let you be satisfied. God will never give up on you, even if you give up on yourself. But if God has to, and God will, God will get where you are, and God will grab you by the nap of the neck or the nose if necessary, and He will say, we live, and y'all come go with me. And so as they move from where they are to where they need to be, they have to go to new, to new pastures. And as they go up there, that new pasture has not yet been checked out by the master, by the shepherd. And in those upper pasture lands are an adder, about three foot long. They're brown adders, and they live in these small holes. And as sheep go by there, they'll reach out and strike them in the, in the legs or wherever they can, and they'll kill those sheep. And so what the shepherd does is the shepherd prevents the sheep from going into that new pasture until he checks it out. He's got on his body uh, 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 about a half a gallon jug of oil, oil, of oil. And he'll go through there, and what he does is when he finds that viper's nest, he'll pour oil around that viper's nest. Not only will he do that, he'll call every sheep up to him, and he'll pour oil all over that sheep's face. So that as that sheep goes into that new pasture, when that viper tries to strike out of his nest because he's poured oil down in there, that, sh that snake can't strike. Does that make sense? 
is a prisoner in his own home. But if, God forbid, that snake somehow or another does get to that sheep because of the anointing oil on that sheep, the sin of it and the, the viscosity of it won't allow that snake to strike that sheep. Does that make sense? And so what God has done is God has prepared a table in the presence of their enemies. God has anointed their head with oil. God has prepared a table before them. God has anointed their cup with oil. Then he makes, then he, then he does something real weird. He changes analogies. He said, my cup overflows. This is not about oil, but water. When they get to those upper terraces, those upper pastures, because it's not strange that there's one off, somebody has dug a well. And somebody has built a cistern. And so that shepherd goes to these higher mountains and he's got to drag that water out of the earth and pour it into the cistern. And it's time consuming. And it takes a kind, considerate, loving shepherd who's going to expend that much energy and that much time to take care of the needs of a sheep. Next question. What has, what has Christ done for you? What's God done for you? If I'm not mistaken, did God not give His Son, His only Son, for you? Did not God turn His back on His Son, His only Son? Did God not let His Son take the full weight of His wrath upon Himself? Did He not suffer humiliation and shame? Did He not, was He not brutally, brutally murdered on a cross of Calvary? Was He not unceremoniously dumped? to a bar or two, and yet although mortal man's hands did this, did not God reach down in grace and mercy, and God set him free, he most certainly did. And so God has done all kinds of extravagant, generous, crazy things to set us free. And so thus it says, my cup overflows. And then he goes on and ends, I will live in the house of my Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. As I read the psalm, David has laid before us reasons to accept the shepherd. Have you? He gives us reasons to sing and serenade our shepherd. He gives us reason that we might sing the songs of grace back to our shepherd because of the grace and the love and the mercy and the care and the possibilities and, the, and all that God has done. Have you tasted of the grace of the Lord? Have you received the benefits of the Lord? Then if you have, David reminds us of one thing, quite frankly, the best of things. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me through heaven's open door. Because this world ain't my home. Ain't my home anymore. One day, Brother Lynn Edward Beckery is going to draw my last earthly breath. And when this cat, when I draw my last breath down here, I'm going to take my first breath up yonder. Amen? Amen. One of these days, I'm going to take flight and I'm going to get all the way home. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to get there because my shepherd got there first. Amen? Amen. Dumb I may be, weak I may be, defenseless I may be. But you know what I do know? I know the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Yet, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod right and your staff, they comfort me. You even prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with all my cup is running over. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so scared I may be, but one day is going to be the best day of my life. Until that day comes, I'm hanging on to Psalms 23. How about you? Amen. 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 Amen.